Well, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Carrie Mokowski. I am the Director of Education here at FAIR and I am delighted to be your moderator for today's discussion. Um, before we get started, I just wanna go over a few quick things. First, please note that we will be recording today's presentation. So all of you with us today, and even those who registered but could not make it, will receive a copy of this recording in about a week. And actually you'll receive a copy or a PDF of the PowerPoint slides as well. So just keep an eye on your inbox sometime within the next week. I'll send out a link for you to be able to access these slides and this recording. Um, that said, to make sure that we can maintain a quality recording, everyone joining us today is gonna to be muted throughout the presentation. However, this is definitely not gonna stop you from joining in on the discussion. Um, if you are joining us from Zoom, you should see a little Q&A button in kind of the bottom toolbar. And you can use this to communicate directly with me. I've got a couple of FAIR colleagues on with us today and you can talk to them as well. But let us know if you're having any kind of technical difficulties. We will of course do our best to help you out. But most importantly, you can use this feature to ask questions. So um, we have built in a little bit of time at the end of the presentation for questions. Clearly we probably won't get to all of them. I know there's uh, many people joining us today. Um, but we'll pick a few of them and we'll moderate them at the end. So please pass them along at any time. And then if you happen to be joining us um, via Facebook Live, you can just add your comments in the question section um, and I promise they'll get over to me. Okay, so with all of that said, now without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's presenter who you see right here. And I'd love to take a minute and just read some of his bio. Um, with us today, we have Dr. John James. He has worked in the field of allergy, asthma, and immunology for over 30 years. He is board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. Um, he lives in Fort Collins, Colorado, and has clinical experience in the diagnosis and management of allergic diseases and asthma with a special interest in food allergy and anaphylaxis. Dr. James is a native of Arkansas and he received his undergraduate degree from the University of Arkansas. He then received his doctor of medicine degree from the University of Tennessee. Dr. James completed his pediatric res residency at the University of Utah. He fulfilled an allergy and immunology fellowship at Johns Hopkins University. And while working there, he received mentorship and training from Dr. Hugh Sampson and Dr. Robert Wood both of whom are noted leaders in the evaluation and management of patients with food allergy. Before joining Colorado and allergy and asthma centers, Dr. James was a medical school faculty member for four years at the University of Arkansas and Little Rock in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. He worked closely with Dr. Wesley Burks, who is another well-known expert in food allergy. Dr. James then worked with Colorado Allergy and Asthma Centers for 24 years before retiring it's a few years ago in 2020. Dr. James served on the board of directors of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology for six years, where he served as the chair of the Maintenance of Certification Committee. In addition, he is a past member of the Medical Advisory Board of the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network. Dr. James has been an active, has been an active on many committees of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and he served a six-year term on the National Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics that plans and organizes allergy immuno immunology and pulmonary programs for their annual meeting. Uh, in 2021, Dr. James started a new medical specialty consulting business called Food Allergy Consulting and Education Services. And that is quite the bio and we are so lucky to have you here with us and your expertise. So, at this time, I am so delighted to turn it over to Dr. James to get things started. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that kind introduction. And that, that is a long, long bio. Um, and I wanna thank Carrie so much for helping uh, organize this presentation and the other webinars that we'll be doing in this five-part series, Fundamentals of Food Allergy. Uh, I am I am presenting from uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, on this snowy day, and and I welcome all the participants from uh, all over from where you're coming from. Thank you. Um, my financial disclosures are listed here. I am 
I do have a consulting business that I started in 2020, Food Allergy Consulting Education Services. And I have two very um, uh, great uh, consulting agreements, one with uh, Food Allergy Research and Education, who I've worked with for many years, and the second with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. So I, and, and no other uh, disclosures that I need to make. So learning objectives today are defining food allergy, talking about the epidemiology of food allergy, reviewing common clinical signs and symptoms of food allergy. I really wanna stress the difference between food allergy and food intolerances. This is a, a very common issue we deal with in clinic and, 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 and in other areas with, with parents and patients with food allergy. We'll speak to mechanisms of food allergy, mainly IgE reactions, and I'll touch on some unique uh, adverse food reactions, including uh, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome and eosinophilic esophagitis. And I'll close with uh, talking about natural history of food allergy. So we can't, if you could just want to talk about the basics, I'm going to, uh, I have to move this off my screen, okay. The, um, to begin with food allergy, just the basics, the basic sort of premise is that the body's immune system sees a food allergen as harmful and reacts by causing symptoms. That is so basic, but it, it is the crux of what we talk about with food allergy. Food allergy is an adverse food reaction arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. Whereas a food intolerance is, uh, is not an immune reaction and can include a variety of different um, causes toxic, pharmacologic, and um, just intolerances in general. We're going to touch on a lot of these today. And again, this will be a big part of the presentation. I'm having trouble advancing that to uh, the slides. Okay, let's make sure I have, go back to the right one here. Sorry about this. Hey, Dr. James, it's Carrie. Are they just advancing on their own, does it seem? No, I think I got, it stopped advancing, but I need to go back to, let's see, I'm gonna escape here and see if I can get it this way. There you go. Okay, now let's see if this can do this. Okay, the public perception of food allergy is 20 to 25%, and actually it can be higher than this, but we know that when we go through the diagnostic procedures and, and, and activities, that, that it's much less than what the public thinks. Um, approximately 32 million people have allergies in the United States, 11% of adults, 8% of children, 10% of infants. The prevalence of food allergy is higher in uh, people who have atopic diseases, such as atopic dermatitis, pollen allergy, and asthma. There has been inc an increase in the prevalence of food allergy over the past two decades, and there has been a tripling of peanut allergy over the past uh, 10 years. Food allergies cause 200,000 emergency room visits per year in the United States. We know that, that a very small amount of peanut, one one hundredth of a peanut, can cause a reaction in peanut allergic patients. Food allergies may cross-react with other allergens. So 
peanuts can cross react with certain tree nuts, but peanuts can also cross react with other legumes such as soy, beans, chickpeas, etc. Milk from different species can cross react. So this would be cow milk, goat's milk, and sheep milk. These forms of milk have very similar proteins so that if you're, if you're milk allergic, cow milk allergic, and you ingest cow, uh, goat milk or sheep milk, it's very likely you're gonna have an allergic reaction. Pitted fruits cross react with birch pollen. So an example would be a patient who has uh, a tree allergy with birch pollen and they might react with certain pitted fruits such as um, peaches, apricots, cherries. And the reason is there's similar proteins in the fruit and in the birch pollen. So this is what many of you might know as pollen food allergy syndrome, uh, previously known as oral allergy syndrome. Patients who have allergy to banana, avocado, and kiwi might cross-react with latex protein. So if you have an individual who has latex allergy, they might find that they do have this oral allergy syndrome with certain uh, fresh fruits that are listed here. And we know that geographical, um, there are geographical issues around the country. If someone in Japan eats, if, the, if that country eats a lot of fish, well, they're likely going to see more fish allergy. In the Middle East, where they eat more sesame, that's where you might see more sesame allergy as opposed to other parts of the world where that is not an issue. Dr. Jane, so the prevalence of food allergy. I yeah. hate to interrupt real quick, and I promise it's probably the only time I'll do it, but would you mind defining cross-react? We had a few people um, ask what that meant. Sure, sure. So cross-reactivity would be if you have an allergic response, I'll go through this in the mechanism in a little bit. If you have an alert, say a peanut allergy, and you have allergic antibody that's directed to a certain protein allergen in peanut, that, that it's possible that that allergic antibody can cross-react with a protein in a tree nut. So a tree nut has an allergen that is very similar to the protein allergen in peanut. So that antibody can react to both of those. That's what a cross-reactivity uh, really means. Is that, that answer yeah, that question? Thank you okay. so much. You bet. Um, so the prevalence of food allergy in U.S. children is listed here. Parent reported pediatric food allergy prevalence is approximately 11.4%. Then going to a convincing pediatric food allergy prevalence, 7.6%. And finally, a physician confirmed convincing food allergy prevalence is down to 4.7%. So that, that's what we talked about earlier. The, Perception might be that there's an allergy, but as you go through the workup, clinical history, diagnostic testing, et cetera, then, uh, or a food challenge, you're going to find maybe it's not as high as it was thought to be. But so this 4.7% is, is really a solid number. Uh, most common physician confirmed food allergies in rank order would be peanut, cow milk, tree nuts, shellfish, and egg. And we'll go over some other common food allergens later. The prevalence a food allergy is higher in black and Hispanic children. What about food allergy and race? This epidemiology studies have been done. These have really been done more recently. Uh, it's been great information for us to look at. Food allergic sensitization is more common among uh, black uh, versus white Americans. Food allergy is more prevalent among black versus white Americans, particularly with shrimp and shellfish or shrimp being one form of shellfish, and peanut. Food allergy outcomes are more severe among black versus white patients, and that's in terms of the reaction, symptomatology, what we see clinically, the frequency of anaphylaxis, and then mortality, mainly among males. What about food allergy in adults? And this information has really been uh, more recently published. It's been very helpful and because we didn't know a lot about it, say 20, 30 years ago. More than one in 10 adults has a reported food allergy, approximately 26 million adults. Peanut allergies uh, affect, and I can't see that on the slide, um, so I'm gonna have to skip over that. 
48% of food allergic adults report the onset of food allergy in adulthood. So this is really important because if you, you have uh, patients who in their first three decades of life have no allergen and all of a sudden at age 40 that they develop uh, a shellfish allergy. I, did, I saw this a lot when I was in Maryland during my fellowship. We'd have guys come in that, that had eaten shrimp and crab and lobster all their lives and then all of a sudden they develop uh, a food allergy and they just could not believe it. And they were you know, not happy about that because of the diet there, but it does happen. So this diagram is just a basic sort of cartoon to, to illustrate the IgE-mediated or immediate uh, immune mechanisms for classic food allergies. This does not pertain to all of the adverse food reactions we're going to discuss today. This is the more classic IgE-mediated form. So if, if, a, if a person has a genetic predisposition for peanut allergy and then they eat peanuts, it gets uh, broken down in the gut, absorbed through the mucosal wall, and it's presented to the immune system, lymphatics. And these cells here are specialized lymphocytes that, that pick up that allergen from the important allergens from the peanut and process it. And then uh, they, it goes to um, other immune cells here, the plasma cell or B cells that make immune globulins. So immune globulins in the allergy realm is gonna be allergen specific IgE. It's one of the classes of immune globulins. And this is the important one in allergy. That, um, that IgE then gets fixed to mast cells here, which are other immune cells, really important in the allergic response. And they bind here to these, these real high affinity receptors on the surface of the mast cells. And then the out, once they ingest that peanut protein again, it gets broken down, processed, that allergen goes, uh, to, it stimulates or activates the mast cell to release preformed mediators. So they're already there waiting to be released. Histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins. And those mediators then go to a variety of tissues in the body and skin, the gut, the lungs, the central nervous system to cause actual symptoms of food allergy. So again, this is the classic IgE-mediated model. This can happen with pollen allergy, with venom allergy, with drug allergy. It's the, it's the same basic mechanism. So immunologic allergy, allergic reactions, I broke, we break them down into three major categories because all not all adverse immune responses to foods are the classic Ig mediated type. And under, under that category, there would be anaphylaxis, oral allergy syndrome, I mentioned previously, gastrointestinal allergy. And then patients with, with allergies to foods can have asthma, hives, and contact or I'm going to go to the Ig mediated group first. Toward, and towards the middle of the talk, I'm going to go to the mixed Ige, non-Ige group, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, other eosinophilic gastroenteropathies, and atopic dermatitis. And finally, I'll talk about the non-IgE-mediated or cell-mediated adverse food reactions, such as food protein-induced enterocolitis, uh, food protein allergic proctitis, celiac disease, and dermatitis or pediformis. What are the routes of exposure for Food allergy. Well, the mo one of the most common is in obviously ingestion of the food with, uh, with food allergens. Most relevant in systemic reactions, and it can depend on the amount of food ingested and sometimes the, the preparation of the food, such as raw milk versus baked milk or raw egg or baked egg. So th that can affect uh, through the ingestion, does it, is it going to be more likely to cause a reaction? Baked egg, I'll just talk about that briefly, is that when you have a raw egg, it's, it's got a conformation that is naturally there. When you bake that protein, it becomes more linear, it denatures that protein. So the immune system might see it differently, may not recognize it as the classic egg protein that it normally sees, and it, it could be tolerated better. Inhalation, this would happen with foods that have been aerosolized, like a steamed milk, cooked 
cooked fish and shellfish is one of the more, most common ones. There's like people cooking and maybe at a, at a picnic or even inside of a restaurant and that the vapor or fumes from that cooking can have allergens in it and patient can inhale those allergens and trigger a significant allergic reaction. A lot of times can be respiratory reactions and anaphylaxis. And then lastly, there's contact um, routes like topically on the skin that could cause localized reactions. But in patients with eczema or atopic dermatitis and the skin is very disrupted, the allergen can gain access to the immune system and, and cause a significant allergic reaction. And in infants with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, the exposure to foods through the skin can be a significant cause for sensitization and ultimately allergy to a food like peanut milk. Before I go through more of the Ig mechanism, I wanted to put in here primary food intolerances. This is that big sort of we're going through uh, all the time in our discussion with uh, patients and families. Food intolerances are adverse food reactions that are not immune based. They do not have an immunologic basis. It's an adverse physiologic response to the food. So it, we have two big categories: toxic pharmacologic reactions like bacterial food poisoning, that this would be like staph food poisoning that can cause symptoms that may mimic an allergic reaction. Scromboid fish poisoning is when fish is not stored properly and it becomes spoiled. So it can cause an increased level of histamine in the, in the fish. And then when a patient ingested, ingests that fish, they can develop hives, flushing, tachycardia, vomiting, nausea, abdominal pain, and it can happen very quickly after ingesting the food. And it looks like an allergic reaction, but it's not. It's the histamine just from the spoiled fish triggering those reactions. There's no underlying immune mechanism. Other causes would be sulfites, caffeine, alcohol, and the histamine, as I mentioned, in scromboid fish poisoning. In the other category, there's non-toxic or intolerances lactase deficiency, which is lactose intolerance. And this is probably you all know is one of the most common food intolerances we see clinically. Uh, pancreatic insufficiency would be like in patients with cystic fibrosis and they might have abdominal symptoms that could be mistaken for food allergy, but it's, an, it's not an immune mechanism. It's based on uh, enzyme deficiencies. Um, hiatal hernias can look like, you know, they can be reflux, they can have abdominal symptoms, that come after ingesting the food, but it's not, again, not an allergic phenomenon. Gustatory rhinitis is when certain patients ingest hot or spicy foods and it stimulates glands in the nose and up, upper respiratory tract to produce mucus and, and cause a sneezing, itchiness of the nose, post-nasal drip and coughing. So certain types of foods, very spicy foods, usually after ingesting them immediately, these gustatory symptoms occur and it's not, it's not an immune mechanism or, or an allergy. So just to summarize that again, I'm, I'm sort of driving this point, I'll drive this point home is that food allergy and food intolerances are different. And uh, food allergies are adverse food reactions that are triggered by an underlying immune mechanism. Food allergies must be addressed by avoidance and at times allergy medications. Food allergies can cause serious life-threatening situations, and we'll talk about anaphylaxis. And the classic example, peanut allergy, milk allergy, um, egg allergy. Food intolerances are adverse physiologic responses following food ingestion without an underlying immune mechanism. And they are treated with specific avoidance measures as well once the, the trigger is identified. Typically in food intolerance reactions, it's more of a digestive system reaction. So we're seeing things like nausea, abdominal pain, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramping, and, and not other systems involved. And again, lactose intolerance would be the most common one most people are aware of. So for now getting back to IgE symptoms, for uh, going through different systems, the mouth, there can be itching and tingling, swelling of the lips, a funny taste in the mouth. Some people describe um, a metallic taste. In the skin, the classic symptoms would be flushing of the skin, urticaria or hives, swelling of the skin or angioedema, and eczema. 
in the gastrointestinal tract. I've mentioned these symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Um, these are real common GI symptoms. In the throat, tightening of the throat or laryngeal edema, which becomes a really worrisome type symptom if we see this non-allergic reaction, hoarseness and cough, lungs, so it'd be shortness of breath, wheezing and cough, and cardiovascular sim symptoms could be a dizziness, a pallor or whiteness of the skin, cyanosis of the extremities, low blood pressure, all of these are going to be extremely worrisome symptoms and, and usually connected to anaphylaxis. In the brain, it's disorientation, lightheadedness, a loss of consciousness that can occur in anaphylaxis. And others would be the full sort of generalized systemic reactions like anaphylaxis. And what is anaphylaxis? It's a severe generalized allergic reaction, can be usually with a group of symptoms. So involving multiple systems like the skin, the gut, the respiratory tract, and cardiovascular systems. Uh, the symptoms can occur shortly after ingesting the food with an allergen and can worsen very rapidly. Sometimes it, it'll take a little longer and you'll have a delay and then they, they come on a little bit later within, within an hour or two, but they come on with a vengeance. And anaphylaxis, as most of you know, can be reversed if appropriate medications are administered quickly and appropriately. And, and, the, and the medication we all know is epinephrine, uh, and it's given intramuscularly in the lateral thigh. And epinephrine can, can combat a lot of things. It can improve this. It can uh, get rid of hives. It can, it can help the, the GI symptoms. It can definitely help the lung symptoms like bronchospasm and and laryngeal edema or tightening in the throat, and it can improve blood pressure and, and perfusion. This, to the left here, this cartoon, just as to summarize for you uh, on the handout, just the, the common grouping of symptoms and anaphylaxis. Additional considerations for anaphylaxis, the majority of episodes involve the skin, hives, angioedema or swelling of the lips and other parts of the body. Anaphylactic reactions can occur without skin symptoms. This is very important. You do not have to have hives or angioedema. You can go straight to gastrointestinal symptoms or even straight to laryngeal or respiratory symptoms. There are cases where uh, cardiovascular or gastrointestinal symptoms come before skin reactions. And sometimes GI symptoms can be extremely significant and may significant, uh, signify a very a significant allergic reaction and epinephrine needs to be given uh, very uh, quickly um, and appropriately. Deaths from anaphylaxis have been reported but are rare. So the timeline of anaphylactic reactions varies from patient to patient. They can start slow and gradually get worse or they can develop quickly and progress rapidly. Sometimes they're uh, Hi, Dr. James. You're muted right now. You just got to unmute. Okay. There you go. We lost your slide deck, but we can see you. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you want me to try to, it's on my screen. Do you want me to do anything on my end? Yeah, maybe just try sharing your screen again. And thanks everyone for your patience. The, the bar at the bottom, Carrie, that allowed me to share screen. Is there another way I can get to that? Let, let me try. Hold on one second. You should be able to. It seems to be frozen. Wait, there goes something. But I can't get to that, you know, the share. Uh, 
Let me see. Hold on. It's not letting you share. No. Do you want to take? Do you want to take the slides and? Let me do you see. Have if them I can. We'll see if I can share or. I can share my screen, Carrie. Okay. Great. Thank you. And Dr. James, where were we at? Can you let us know? I'm right here on the food allergy reactions additional consideration, the timeline. With our, can you see my screen right now? Yep. With with the slides? Yep. There you go, Tiffany. Showing up in a real small screen. I don't know if that, but I can use. Okay, that's the slide. Whoop. Here you go. Perfect. Oh, and just let us know when to advance, Dr. James. Okay, let's see. Go back one. Is that Tiffany that's got it now? Yep. Tiffany, go back a slide. There's the EpiPens. That's it. Okay, so where I was was talking about um, you can have one phase of an anaphylactic reaction, or you can have that phase and then four to, out, hours, four to eight hours later, there can be a biphasic um, anaphylactic reaction. So you have the initial anaphylactic reaction and then symptoms settle down and then there's a short period of quiescence and then there's another phase. That's called a biphasic reaction. Reactions need to be recognized and taken seriously. It's important to administer epinephrine early if anaphylaxis is suspected and activate emergency medical services. Next slide. So the rate of food-induced anaphylaxis is increasing in the United States. Uh, insurance claims have been looked at with a diagnosis of anaphylaxis. And in, this, in one study from 2007 to 2016, there was an increase in food-induced anaphylaxis of 5% in 2007, up to 22% in 2016, a very significant increase. Incidence of fatal food anaphylaxis is very rare, about one in 10 million, or about the rate of fatality from a lightning strike. Next slide. Less common food allergy symptoms are listed here. Headaches, itchy eyes, chest pain, itching without rash, and seizures. Next slide. So this is the diagram I showed earlier. We've gone through IgE-mediated adverse food reactions. Now I'm gonna shift over to mixed IgE, non-IgE reactions. These are still in the, the group of food allergies, but they're not uh, classic IgE-mediated. Eosinophil esophagitis, I'll, I'll speak to in the, in the slide. Next slide. And then eosinophilic gastroenteropathies, and atopic dermatitis. So we'll go to the next slide. So in this category, eosinophilic esophagitis, I'm sure many of you are aware, aware of this condition. It is an inflammation of the esophagus and eosinophilic, these are blood cells that circulate and they can go to the esophagus and cause significant inflammation causing uh, the symptoms we'll talk about here. It, it's a condition that has become more and more studied over the past two decades. So it's a condition that has really been recognized more and we're, and we're recognizing it and diagnosing it more clinically. In children, symptoms vary by age and include feeding disorders, vomiting, abdominal pain, dysphagia, food impaction. Infants may also have a failure to thrive. In adults, the symptoms are more, more geared towards the food impaction, the dysphagia, and I've got to mention that that is a problem with swallowing. It's a, it's a swallowing problem in the esophagus. And food impaction is when the food actually gets lodged in the esophagus and it's not moving down. So it can be a very, very painful and very distressful uh, symptom. Reflux can also be associated with the EOE and it's when those patients with reflux are not responding to therapy that we might also think about EOE. 
The diagnosis is made with upper GI endoscopy. It's looking for the amount of eosinophils in the mucosa, and it should be greater than 15 eosinophils per high power field when the pathologist looks at the samples, the biopsies. Food allergies have been implicated in some cases, but this food allergies are not thought to be the only cause for um, EOE. And then there are other eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders, eosinophilic gastritis, gastroenteritis, enteritis, and colitis. Atopic dermatitis that I mentioned earlier, this is a very chronic, itchy, dry, red, raised rash, usually localized to flexor areas in adults, so in the, in the folds of the arms and legs and the neck, and extensor surfaces in infants, or the back of the, of the arms and legs, and can be on the cheeks of the face as well. The rash can be generalized. There are chronic lesions that can become thickened and hyperpigmented. The rate of food allergy is approximately 30 to 40 percent. These are usually patients who have more difficult to manage atopic dermatitis, and we should be thinking about that and, and uh, thinking about food allergy as a potential trigger factor. The last category of adverse food reactions that are immune-based are the non-Ig mediated, but they're a different mechanism, this cell-mediated form of the immune system. And food protein-induced intercolitis, or FPIs, would be what I'm going to focus on here mainly, and then food protein-induced enteropathy, food protein-induced proctocolitis. I do want to mention celiac disease. I didn't say anything about that earlier. It is more of an autoimmune disease. So it's the gluten in, in gluten grains that contain proteins that stimulate an antibody response, IgA, IgA antibodies to uh, certain proteins in the gluten grains. And this, this, as you know, can cause a lot of GI symptoms, abdominal pain, bloating, uh, gas, diarrhea. And it's once it is identified, uh, it, the strict avoidance of, of gluten grains, um, wheat, rye, and barley need to be implemented because there can be bad outcomes if, they're, if, they're, if restrictions are not made, such as even malignancy in the gut. Dermatitis herpetiformis is a skin disorder that is associated with celiac disease. Next slide. And one more slide. Thank you. Um, food protein, and this is, these are the non-IG mediated conditions I just mentioned. I'm just gonna highlight a few. Food protein induced allergic uh, proctocolitis is gross blood in the stool in infants, otherwise well and well appearing. They have really no other symptoms. It's usually just uh, blood, mucousy blood in, in the stool. This it can be caused by cow milk, soy, and other foods. It can, it can, it can be from the, those in the breast milk or from formulas, and it usually resolves by a year of age. Food protein induced intercolitis syndrome. I'm going to cover that on the next slide. So I'll wait there. And then celiac disease, I had just mentioned that one on the last slide. So let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to give a little more detail for these two disorders food protein induced allergic proctocolitis, inflammation of the distal colon in response to food proteins such as cow milk and soy. It, both, it can enter through the breast milk or infant formulas mucus streaked blood in the stool in an otherwise healthy thriving infant. Appropriate food elimination is therapeutic and the symptoms or the disease will resolve around one year of age. FPIs, it's, it's profuse projectile repetitive vomiting often with diarrhea leading to dehydration and lethargy within one to four hours following food ingestion. The foods in children are cow milk, soy, rice, and cereal grains. Adults, uh, seafoods can be very typical, such as um, scallops, clams, oysters would be the mollusk. And specific food elimination is, is necessary. Next slide. So these conditions have not been proven to be related to food allergy. Migraine headaches, behavioral developmental disorders like attention deficit disorder, arthritis, seizures, inflammatory bowel disease. Now, I'm not saying that some patients with inflammatory bowel disease might eat foods and they find that those foods aggravate their IBD, 
but they're not ultimately proven to be a specific food allergy. It would be more likely an intolerance to certain certain foods like dairy or that can aggravate. So they might think that that's a food allergy, but when when evaluated and tested, they, that does not prove out. Next slide. The major common food allergens are listed here in children, eggs, cow milk, peanuts, and tree nuts. In adults, peanuts, shellfish, tree nuts, and cow milk. Next slide. This just this slide just um, tabulates the prevalence of the nine uh, major food allergens that are listed here. Cow milk, 2.5%, ag 2%, peanut up to 3%, shellfish 2% and, and so on. So I wanted not only to show the prevalence, but to show the, the major food allergens that have been, um, that are listed and this plays a big role in food labeling and the labeling laws and, and such that we've, um, we've seen a change through uh, the past several years. Next slide. I'm gonna skip that slide, we'll go to the next slide. The economic impact of food allergies, um, childhood food allergy result in significant medical costs um, for the health system and even larger costs for families with food allergic children. The total annual direct and indirect costs are up to 24.8 billion annually and 4, over $4,000 annually per child with food allergies. These are very high numbers. Next slide. Now the natural history of food allergies. Uh, about 80% of milk, soy, egg, and wheat allergies were met by the teenage years. And some of this can be seen with uh, diagnostically with de declining uh, skin test levels or declining serum specific IgE levels. Uh, milk and egg tolerance to extensively baked uh, forms of, of these proteins can precede the development of tolerance uh, to um, unheated forms of milk and egg. Uh, there's a high likelihood of developing further allergic disease if a patient has food allergy. So if a patient has peanut allergy or egg allergy or milk allergy, they have uh, up to a 30% chance of developing uh, allergies to other foods or a greater than 90% chance of developing allergic rhinitis and asthma, 50 to 90%. This is, this is really significant. Um, and in the non-IG mediated GI allergy, I mentioned the allergic proctocolitis and FPIs, these, these can resolve in, in several years and are typically not lifelong. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through several um, food allergens. Milk allergies, the most common food allergy in children. Uh, it usually develops in the first six to 12 months. Symptoms are listed here, including eczema, hives, wheezing, anaphylaxis in some patients, um, but not isolated nasal symptoms and mucus production. Greater than 50% of cow milk allergic children will outgrow this allergy by five to 10 years of age and 80% outgrow by age 16. Next slide. Egg allergy is the second most common food aller allergy, uh, usually develops in the first uh, couple of years of life. 80% risk of allergic rhinitis and asthma at age four. So again, this, these are very significant numbers. If, if you know someone has egg allergy or you diagnose it, you can discuss it with, with families. That there, It puts that infant or child at a higher risk to develop atopic disease and most worrisome with asthma. Over 70% of children may tolerate extensively heated egg. We talked about that earlier. Gr uh, greater than 50% outgrow egg allergy by nine years of age and 80% outgrow by age 16. Patients with egg allergy can receive the M MMR vaccine and influenza vaccines because there is extremely small, if any, egg protein in these vaccines. And many studies have been done in egg allergic patients receiving these vaccines demonstrating that they can receive these vaccines without adverse or allergic reactions. Next slide. Peanut allergy, uh, the prevalence has tripled um, from 1997, 0.4% uh, to 1.4% in 2008. Symptoms um, usually by two years of age, and this is um, of note, 75% of reactions can occur on first exposure. 
The food allergy most commonly associated with anaphylax would be peanuts and also tree nuts would be just behind that. 150 uh, deaths per year. About 20% of peanut allergic patients will become tolerant over time. Uh, and there's a relapse rate of about 9%. Next slide. Tree nut uh, allergies usually develop between one to seven years of age. Um, and in adults, uh, shellfish allergies develop in about 60%. So, uh, allergy, but allergies to tree nuts, seeds, fish, and shellfish are typically lifelong. These are the group that we know that are not likely to be outgrown. Uh, tree nuts, we know about 10%. So there's a, there's a small chance, but, but not like we saw in the other foods mentioned. Rare for seafood, fish, and seeds. And there are favorable factors. So again, if the reduction in the skin test size to the food allergen here, or decreasing serum IgE levels, or resolution of atopic dermatitis. Next slide. Weed allergy prevalence uh, up to 1%. Cross reactivity, we, admit, we talked about that earlier with other grains uh, like, like rye, barley, oat, and just regular grasses. So again, there can be that allergic cross reactivity in 20%. Some patients have an exercise induced anaphylaxis syndrome with wheat allergies, very distressing uh, clinical syndrome. Resolution of wheat allergy 50% by age seven, 65% by age 12. Next slide. Additives and colorings, uh, food additives and colorings are derived from natural sources. They contain proteins, can induce allergic reactions. So examples would be turmeric, annatto, and carmine from insects. So these, these can cause allergic reactions. They need to be aware of these. But on the bottom two panels, uh, chemical additives and colorings like tartrazine and yellow dye 5 are not likely to cause Ig-mediated food allergic reactions. Sulfites that in the past were added to foods as a preservative and anti-browning agent. In sensitized patients, sulfites could induce asthma, but it, it's not, it gets an intolerance, not a, a food allergy. Uh, I remember back in my fellowship days, we saw a lot more sulfite allergy, but after the FDA made changes and how this could be used, this has really dropped off dramatically and rarely uh, is this seen um, in the clinical arena now. Next slide. Spices, uh, any part of the plant that's used for uh, seasoning or flavoring. Spices can be obtained from bark, leaves, seeds, roots, buds, um, fruit or other parts of the plant. An herb is usually obtained from a leafy part of the plant. Most people use the term spice and herb interchangeably. Spice allergy is very rare, only five to 10 people and 10,000 adults. Examples of spices that we might evaluate in the clinic would be celery, cumin, uh, coriander, fennel, cloves, anise. Next slide. So wrapping it up, uh, food allergies in adults. The, we didn't know a lot about this when I first started in, in allergy, uh, an allergy practice, but really over the past five to 10 years, there have been wonderful publications and studies that have focused on adults with food allergy. More and more is being published um, in this area. The age of peak age of on, onset is 30 years. I mentioned that earlier with some with shellfish that patients that I had seen that, that were fine uh, early on, but then in their 40s develop shellfish allergy. Anaphylaxis is reported in about half of cases. Now that's very, very significant and concerning. And responsible foods in adults typically would be shellfish. And that can include shrimp, crab, lobster. Could also include clams, scallops, and oysters. And then tree nuts, a whole variety of tree nuts, fish, a uh, variety of fish, soy, and peanuts. Next slide. So uh, summarizing, we, we discussed definition of food allergy and food intolerance. I really hope, I really wanted to distinguish these for you. To, to, that's a huge point in the clinical arena uh, to be able to talk with families and patients about epidemiology of food allergy. We've learned more and more about this over the last decade or two, underlying mechanisms, specifically the IgE mechanism, uh, the clinical signs and symptoms of food allergy, 
not only the classic food allergies, but the the F pies, the eosinophilic esophagitis, celiac disease I mentioned as well. Common food allergies, we spent a good amount of time on that and the natural history of food allergies, which is very helpful in the clinical setting to talk to families and patients with food allergies about what to expect in the future. Um, I'm finished, but before quick, I want to thank Carrie Malkowski again and Karen Patriarca Elliott, two people at FAIR who were very instrumental in, in helping put together this um, webinar. And sorry about all of the technical difficulties, but uh, we did get through it, I think. So, Carrie, I'm going to do questions. Yeah, on. I think, uh, thank you so much. I think we've got some time for some questions. Um, thanks, Tiffany. And just a first, I'll reiterate that. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. It looks like there's like maybe 1,200 people here. So technical difficulties happen, uh, but I wanted to also tell you guys, in case you missed it in the beginning, um, this is being recorded and the slides will be available. So, so sorry if you know you missed something on a slide, they were chock full of such good information, but don't worry, you'll get the recording, you'll get the slides, um, so you should be all set. So with that, I'm gonna jump into the, the next like seven, eight minutes and we can just fire some questions at Dr. James. You guys have sent him some amazing questions and I've going to try to group them so we get to kind of the most topics as possible. And I'm going to start out with kind of something you mentioned during the natural history of food allergies, and that's just about outgrowing allergies. And I know you kind of talked about it with different, the percentages with each allergen, but just can you speak a little bit more on this topic of outgrowing allergies? I know we have a lot of parents or caregivers that are really questioning, like, is this, is this common? You know, is my child going to be one of maybe the lucky ones that does outgrow their allergy, you know, and are some allergens, you know, um, easier to outgrow than others, like a peanut or an egg compared to others? And by what age could you expect it? So I know you touched on it a little, but just kind of some, some broad information about outgrowing um, allergies. Sure. That's a really great question. Um, I kind of look at it in two groups. So we have the foods that we know are very likely to be outgrown, uh, or we have a higher chance about the child or infant or child teenager has a good chance about growing. That would include cow milk, egg, soy, wheat. These are the ones that typically, and over the years, have it's been seen in many, many studies that these are the ones that a much higher chance to outgrow these. I mean, I used to, early on, I, we used to say milk and egg was like 80% chance. Now in those slides, you'll see uh, we have more information now and it, sometimes it's not that high, but those are the foods that in that group that I would call the more likely foods to, or food allergies to be outgrown. On the flip side of that, we know that peanut, peanut has been studied extensively and this is the one that we'd love to see more people outgrowing this but it, it in studies has been shown about 20 percent of peanut allergic individuals will outgrow their peanut allergy but that leaves a big 80 percent group that does not and and sh a shellfish is extremely rare to be outgrown sesame extremely unlikely to be outgrown i showed you the data with tree nuts about 10 percent so there are there there are groups of foods that's sort of like there on either end that we can counsel families and patients about that. And I'll just throw in this this is going to be a webinar later, but talking about oral immunotherapy, and that's why that has become such a big thing and uh, around the world really trying to use oral immunotherapy to promote desensitization. And the holy grail would be what's called sustained unresponsiveness or tolerance to that food allergen. So we're gonna be talking about that later. Yeah, wonderful. And just so everyone does know, this is part one of a five part series that Dr. James is delivering for us. So a lot of questions did come in around treatment and prevention. And so throughout the year, we're gonna take a deeper dive into those topics. Um, so thank you, great answer. Um, moving on, this is a question I get at FAIR a lot. Um, and it came, it came through from a couple people asking about kind of the level of severity when it comes to allergic reactions. And one, one, one woman was saying how her child had always, I guess, presented with hives as a baby. 
but then was asking like, is it possible that, you know, later on in her life, she eats the same food and causes a reaction, but it's not hives, it's something else. So I think sometimes we hear like, is it a severe or a mild food allergy or is it a severe or a mild food allergy reaction? So can you talk about maybe, you know, someone may not present the same symptoms and, you know, every time that they have a reaction, can those change? Like, would it always be hives, for example, or could it be some other part of the body system? Yeah, yeah that's also a, a great question. And it is a common question that we see in the clinic. So we'll start with the hive issue. So if that's a very common symptom of an allergic reaction. And the allergic reactions, I would tell parents, typically they're going to reproduce what they've done from the start. I mean, they'll, they'll have hives again. They don't typically go on to have GI symptoms or respiratory symptoms. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's rep the, reprodu the reactions are typically reproducible. So if you have an egg allergy, you eat egg or get accidental exposure to egg and you have hives, then in the future, that typically is what will happen in the next reaction with the exposure to egg. Um, one of the parts of the question was, can you have hives? And then on another reaction, could you have gastrointestinal or respiratory? Yes, that can happen. And those are in terms of severity type of reactions as you get multiple systems and you get those, especially those respiratory symptoms I mentioned, the throat closing, the wheezing, coughing, um, the any kind of cardiovascular system. Those are good. The severity will change as those as that symptom profile is put together. And there are um, studies where they look at these gradations of a severity of reaction, mostly research studies. So I'd love to say that the isolated symptoms always are isolated. I mean, most of the time they are, but I can't say 100% that they wouldn't change to gastrointestinal or respiratory. I know that's not the answer most people want to, they want to, you know, a definite answer, but it's that's generally not, can't be done. Thank you so much. And that kind of leads into the next question. I think we have time for probably about two more. And this is one that we, again, get at FAIR and that's come through live here a few times. And that's talking about treatment in the, of an allergic reaction and antihistamine, such as we're all kind of familiar with Benadryl and then, you know, an epinephrine, epinephrine auto injector. Um, and one of the questions was asking, you know, when there are signs of anaphylaxis, does giving or excuse me, does giving antihistamines first, could that mask those signs of anaphylaxis? And then second, a second part of the question, you know, is it always best to give an epinephrine auto injector when you're seeing signs of signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis? Um, you know, or should you be a little hesitant? and just give an antihistamine? This is one of the most common questions that comes to us as providers from, from families or from patients. And I think we strongly recommend that if, if it's an anaphylactic reaction, the symptoms are compatible with anaphylaxis, give the epinephrine first and early. Don't wait. And, and I know this that in the real world, when we see it doesn't always happen like that. People will give antihistamines first, um, but if it's thought to be an anaphylactic reaction, you know, it could be multiple systems involved, or the hives are generalized on the body. They're having if they're having resp any respiratory symptoms or beyond that, epinephrine needs to be given. And there's never going to be any. If you give epinephrine and it wasn't any, there should never be any judgment there because if you were thinking anaphylaxis, epinephrine needs to be given. And it, it the downside is so minimal compared to the upside. Uh, there was, oh, I just went to a conference, uh, our national conference, and one of the studies was talking about this very issue, antihistamines and epinephrine and steroids. And that it, they just showed that if you want to give it antihistamines, fine, but you still need to give the epinephrine you don't you know they can they won't counteract each other and they might antihistamine might help some symptoms but the epinephrine is the treatment of choice it's hands down for treatment treating anaphylaxis thank you dr james that is the best takeaway and so i 
I think we're at time. So I want to be mindful of that. And for the probably the fifth time, call out this five part series. And anaphylaxis is actually a topic that Dr. James is going to do a deep dive in. So he'll cover this and so much more about recognizing signs and symptoms of allergic reactions. And don't quote me, but I think that's going to be in July. So we'll make sure that, you know, everyone who registered for this webinar today is in the loop of when all these um, other topics are going to be discussed. So Again, a huge thank you to Dr. James for his expertise in this amazing presentation. And then another huge thank you for all of you joining us today. You asked such thoughtful questions. Um, I noticed there's people from all over the globe joining us. So this is just such important information and thank you for taking the time to educate yourself um, about a topic that's definitely near to our heart. So, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day and yeah, that you join us um, in May for the next part of the series where we'll be talking about diagnostics. So thanks everyone.